beautiful and moving Hitting Home with Sarah Ferguson. And Sarah is here tonight for this special Q&A. In the words of Rosie Batty, every woman has the right to be safe, loved and have a future. Now, political leaders on all sides recognise the crisis, but as we know, all too often, political commitment can fail to deliver effective policy and change. So could we really turn around this epidemic in a single generation? Well, answering your questions tonight, the head of domestic violence, New South Wales, Lou Bolsh, the Minister for Social Services, Christian Porter, Northern Territory Labor Senator, Nova Paris, New South Wales Assistant Police Commissioner, Mick Fuller, and Professor of Social Work at Melbourne University, Cathy Humphreys. Please welcome our panel. And our best wishes to the Minister for Women, Michaelia Cash, who was to join this discussion, but is now unavailable. Inevitably, tonight's discussion is a difficult one for the thousands of people caught up in domestic violence. If you or someone you know needs help, please contact the Domestic Violence Helpline or the Men's Referral Line. Let's go now to our first question, which comes from Jane Mulroney. It's reassuring that a Prime Minister can name the dynamics of violence against women for what they are, and that is based on power and the disrespect for women. However, having worked in the area of domestic violence for some years now, I feel that we've gone backwards in a big way in terms of service provision. In New South Wales, many women's refuges have been defunded and in some cases funding given to agencies that have limited experience in this complex area of work. When more women are dying at the hands of their partners, how can it make sense to reduce women's access to safe emergency accommodation and support? OK, Sarah Ferguson, I'm going to go to you first on this one. You spent some time in a woman's refuge. Yeah. Did you feel that that particular refuge and others that you had any contact with were well equipped to meet the need? The need was obvious all the time. The day I arrived, which we saw in the first episode of the program, there, was, uh, there were three, actually three families trying to get in that day and one woman being brought in in extremis. So a group of very dedicated workers were trying to deal with a whole series of different crises really around the state and trying to bring them into the refuge. And in the whole time that I was there, that the revolving door was going. There were people coming every day. That Some of the staff, they were on the phone every day. The staff there do a very good job of taking people who come in broken, giving their confidence back, but it takes a very long time. And that's one of the things that struck me and is the question I have about how we fund refuges correctly and how we deal with this crisis, it being not the only way to do it. It takes time and it takes a lot of manpower, woman power, to take those people and to re fix them and help them rebuild their lives. So th my question is the same as that. How do we provide sufficient funding when I just saw a very tiny portion of people, but there were hours and months being spent on those individuals to get them back into a happy, safe life <coughs> in the community? And Mo, you've spent many hours and months yourself. What, what, what do you think is an adequate level of resourcing for, the, for what seems an inexhaustible need right now? And is it being met in, these, in the, the refuges and the number of beds available? Look, it's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's, it's woefully inadequate, I think. There are a number of women um, who are unable to access services. Um, we need, um, you know, a real injection of cash into the system over a long term. Um, if we're going to really seriously be able to meet the demand um, for not just refuges, but a range of different crisis services. Um, we need a dedicated funding stream um, that is looking at being able to, to fund the entire response system for at least 10 or 20 years if we're going to meet the sort of um, the, the, the crisis that we're seeing. Mm. Well, Christian Porter is a man who's responsible for, for the budget um, when it comes to uh, federal work in this area. You've already allocated a, a, a decent number amount of money, which you have, which you announced today. Do you think that the the responses of those people who are working the area, who say that there's just not enough in terms of the number of beds and the resources at the front line, uh, has any merit? Look, prior to politics, I was a crown prosecutor, so I had a front line role, and I, I mean, watching that powerful documentary tonight, Sarah, well done. Last time I was here, we were talking about an awful documentary of Struggle Street. What you've done has really contributed something to the national debate. 
so, so I saw the sort of problems that Moo's talking about. I, I think that we all sit here and watch that documentary. It becomes impossible for any member of government at any level, state or federal, to say that what's happening at the moment is perfect or perfectly the right amount. But I would say, Jane, that um, with respect to your question, the way in which um, services and addressing problems that are associated with and that cause domestic violence has grown over several decades, I think is, is very, very positive. Uh, our government, the coalition government, has outlined a $100 million package. I think that's a very significant improvement. Um, by comparative world standards, it's a, it's a large measure. Uh, but of course, there's always going to be service gaps. And in, in a whole variety of areas of service delivery in state and federal government that all compete against each other. So look, there have been very significant improvements. There is clearly more to be done, um, but what we have done as a government is take, I think, um, a, a really significant step forward in this area, something that is far greater than any government's previously done at a federal level, and we are now well and truly in this space. Mm. Nova Paris, where do you see the need at the moment? The need is, um, we're, we're hearing things like what Jane said, you know, uh, women's shelters are closing down. You know, we, we've, um, we had the, the current government who um, were going to cut um, legal service community, legal services, Aboriginal legal services. Um, if we are fed income about, you know, tackling this national crisis, I think, you know, it requires leadership. And we heard Malcolm Turnbull talk today about having a political leadership, but also having a cultural change. And the cultural change needs to come from a leader who's willing to actually step into this, this known area. Um, and both sides of parliament needs to actually um, uh, come to the party in terms of securing long-term funding. You know, right now you have a sector where everyone's um, fighting for the same bucket of money. And, you know, we're, we're not going to ever get the outcome. I saw a statistic come through the other day that there are over 70,000 men right across this country who are on AVOs. You know, this is a national crisis. And when both sides of parliament can come together and give... Um, serious, um, I guess, focus and commitment to a national security. This is a national you know, security. We've got women fleeing for their lives. Mm. This is national security and we need to put the money in if we really want to get the outcome that we're all talking about. You've got Rosie Batty, Australian of the Year. If we can't honour the courage that that woman's you know, taken to, to, to the forefront, um, you know, we've let ourselves down. We've let Australian women down. We've let Australian children down. We've let the future generations down. We need to tackle this and come to the party and provide all the services, the, 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 the serious funding that they need to tackle this national crisis. Mm. And what's your response to that? In your research, you, you, you look right across the role of, of uh, the courts, the resources, the families. Where do you think the money needs to be spent now? Well, you want the money to go everywhere. Um, and to fund the whole service system. I guess, you know, if, if uh, you know, just a quick answer to that question, I'd just go prevention, prevention, prevention. We actually really need to be um, looking after and, and capacity building our young people, our children and young people. We're not going to treat our way out of this crisis. We've got to be able to really invest and capacity build the investment that's happening around respect for relationships in schools, making that a whole of school um, initiative so that in fact we are looking at the way in which we are supporting young people around gender equality and um, respect for relationships. Okay, next question is from Jenna Price. Uh, earlier um, in 2013, we decided that we were gonna start counting dead women. So this is a project of Destroy the Joint. And now we think that the Counting Dead Women project has had a really useful effect on the reporting of uh, uh, fatal violence against women. And this year, we've now reached 78. That's 78 women who've died as a result of violence. Not all of it's family violence, but we think around three quarters of that number is either a current partner or a past partner. Would it help if we started making reporting family violence, reporting uh, violence against women, mandatory reported, um, and I'd really like to ask um, Cathy Humphreys, would, would ma mandatory reporting for family violence work? Now, Cathy, I do just want to come to you, but first I want to ask <laughs> Mick, Mick Fuller on the, on the question <laughs> of mandatory yeah, reporting. Yeah, thanks, Julia. And look, you know, from my perspective is that 
you're at home and you hear something outside and you see someone stealing your neighbour's car and what's the first thing you do? You ring triple O. You don't hesitate. But you hear something next door, people fighting, something smashes, someone crying, you wait. I oh, will just wait 10 minutes. And I think the big problem is, is that we need to criminalise domestic violence. We talk about it as a, a huge social issue, which it is, but it's a crime. And I think until as a community, we embrace domestic violence as a crime, the offenders are criminals, you know, the bystanders will continue to think they're innocent. But I think the real challenge is that I don't think there's any innocent bystanders in this space. But are you saying then if we criminalise the behaviour, we won't need something like mandatory reporting? Look, What's I, your view on I that? I think that's a real challenge is because then you have to enforce it. And, and in a domestic situation, you need to provide such a high level support to the victim. We need high level of accountability to the offender. I, I don't think we need another trench of, of an arrest and investigation into this. But your point is a sound one. We need to build this ability for people to have the confidence to ring and report domestic violence like they report someone's car being stolen. Mm. Nova, what's, what's your belief about the need for mandatory reporting? Because, of course, that is the case in the Northern Territory. Um, it is. That's correct. And uh, um, mandatory um, reporting, again, um, you know, what we've heard is the the scepticism of, you know, what if I, we'll, we'll wait, you know, and then quite often we know um, when they don't report or the fear of the reper repercussions on them if they don't report, but, um, you know, up in the Northern Territory, we've got so many mandatory legislations. We've got one with the, the mandatory sentencing and, and we know that that works because um, almost 60% of men in, in jail are through domestic violence. Um, and then you've got those people that are in remand, which are around the 60-70% as well, which are on domestic violence orders. So when, when you um, say we're going to do remanding, again, the whole sort of regulation around it has to be adhered to. When you look at the mandatory sentencing, when people go in, we know that the, um, the, the re-offending of those people that go into the system, it's like a, it's like a turn gate. They go in, they go out. You know, we've had programs in the, the uh, jail system that have been cut. Um, so we can't rehabilitate those violent offenders. They go into jail and, you know, they have a lot of time to think about that, more angry when they came out and they re-offend. So there's, you know, there's, it's a very complex system. And if you mandatory um, sentence people, mandatory report, we've got to be prepared to put all those resources to ensure that we want to get the outcome that we're trying to get. Mm -hmm. And Catherine, quickly, I cut you off, sorry. That's all right. Um, I mean, firstly, I'd just like to congratulate Destroy the Joint. I do think that they've... What they've done is take the statistic away and put the human face on the statistic, and I think that's been incredibly mm. valuable. In terms of mandatory reporting, look, I think it's really complicated. I'd say that the mandatory reporting of children um, into child protection, which has occurred in some states, has been a disaster. Mm. That, in fact, all it's done is completely flood those child protection systems and actually at least 75%, if not 80% 80, 80 of children go in as a report and go straight out because they don't meet the threshold for an investigation and a substantiation. And a lot of that is for very good reasons, you know, that in fact you don't investigate where you've got um, a supportive and um, non-offending non parent, a protective parent. So that we've had, a, I think, we're drawing back now from thinking that mandatory reporting of all children where you've got domestic violence um, is, is the way to go. Um, I think that it's created probably more problems than it's solved. Doesn't mean to say that all children don't need a service. Doesn't mean to say that all children don't need to be helped, mm. but they don't need to be in the tertiary end of the system. Now, I think there's a lot of unintended consequences that may come from mandatory reporting of domestic violence where it's adult women. Okay. Mm. Look, we have, we have several relatives of murdered women in this audience, and we'd like to acknowledge those parents sisters and brothers who've been brave enough to attend tonight. Now, a recurring theme in their questions is lack of action over breached AVOs. Here are two of those heartbreaking stories. The first from Nadia Green. Um, my daughter, Alira, was 23 years old and six months pregnant um, when she was stabbed by her partner in um, 2013. Police were called on three occasions throughout that, um, throughout that time, um, but there was no action taken. Um, 
and O'Leary just lost faith in the police in the end. Um, so my question is, why are some police not assisting victims with AVOs, especially when they're called to the home after a domestic violence incident? And when they are fully aware of the perpetrator's history of violence towards um, other women? And why aren't the laws tougher on perpetrators who breach AVOs and cause actual bodily harm or commit murder? Thank you, Nadia, for that question and for coming along tonight. Our second question is from Rebecca Paulson. On the day of my 33rd birthday, my father, my four-year-old niece, Marley, and my one-year-old nephew, Bass, were stabbed to death by my brother-in-law, who then suicided. Two weeks before my father was murdered, he'd rung and reported a breach of the AVO, uh, but the perpetrator, my brother-in-law, wasn't arrested and there was no charges laid and he was free to murder my family. On the very day of the murders, another violent breach of the AVO was reported at 7am. At 1.33, the perpetrator, my brother-in-law, was still free and to murder my family. So my question echoes the one before, why aren't police following the mandatory procedures 100% of the time for breaches of AVOs? Thank you, Rebecca. Now, I want to talk, to talk to you, Mick, about that in just a moment, but Moo, uh, is, this, is this a common <coughs> experience? Is this something that you hear a lot in the women you, with the women you've worked with? We, we do hear it a lot. I think uh, the policing system has improved um, astronomically over the last decade or so, um, and I think we'll be hearing more about some of the improvements, um, particularly in the New South Wales Police, but we hear about breaches of AVOs all the time, and we also hear about the legal system failing women um, and their families. Um, I mean, we can have a whole conversation about the family court and the, the re-victimisation of women and children there, but I think um, if we're really serious about responding to this number of deaths, then we're going to have to start tightening up the system in every, <coughs> excuse me, every area. Mm. Um, you nodded strongly then about the legal system. Uh, uh, system. I had an experience as a State Attorney General. What you have put with respect to breaches of restraining orders and violence restraining orders is just 100% right. We were faced with this problem in Western Australia <coughs> where the courts tendency to not sentence people to a term of imprisonment for multiple breaches of a restraining order was very high. That very few people would go to prison and we faced this problem and I remember being Attorney General and listening to the legal community and which is always naturally reticent to have mandatory sentencing. So we, instead we took a strong presumption that someone should go to prison if they had multiple breaches and things just didn't change. And I still regret not going as far as what we should have gone which is mandatory penalties of imprisonment at a state level for people who have multiple breaches of violence restraining orders. It is the only solution to that problem. Mm. Mick Fuller. Yeah, Julie, we have come a long way and no doubt over the years people have been let down. Yeah, I, I think over the last three years, particularly in New South Wales, there's been a big shift around supporting the victims, which is absolutely imperative and that needs to continue. But I think where we've missed the point on domestic violence is that we've rated ourselves on how well we we act after the offence, mm. like how quickly we respond, how quick we take the statement. And there's you know, some wonderful evidence in new technology around evidence in chief and the fact we get this wonderful film and it supports the victims. But what we need to change our, our thinking is here, and this gets back to the whole criminalisation of domestic violence is, if you're an armed robber or a car thief, we target you before you steal your next car. And, and the big change in New South Wales, the, the, the change from a policing perspective is that it's not about how well we respond after the incident. It's about how, how well we target that individual, that criminal, before he assaults his next partner. But the question still remains about it, are there sufficient penalties for breach of, of AVOs? Look, you know, the, so we've started this new targeting system of the DV offenders uh, and the first five offenders, the first two have gone to court uh, for breaching AVOs, uh, and they both received nearly 12 month custodial sentences, which I think is an outstanding result. And part of that is because the investigation was, was obviously uh, a lot more detailed, the, the, ev the evidence that police presented was a lot more detailed. So again, it is a shift for us in saying that the, the orders are a good tool for us to arrest these criminals before they commit the offence. Mm -hmm. So I think that we do need to change the way that policing thinks about domestic violence. Victims are high need, we need a high response, but not just our response after the victim's assaulted, 
It's about how well we manage the offender before they commit their next crime. Mm. OK, Cathy. So, I mean, it's very clear that um, the intervention orders are only as good as they're honoured in the breach. Um, they're, otherwise, they're not worth the paper. And they're a really important tool um, in the family violence intervention, domestic and family violence intervention. And we have seen huge increase uh, of police taking this seriously and taking out intervention orders on behalf of victims as well. That's been a fantastic shift. It's not a shift that you get overseas, actually. So that the ability of police in Australia to be able to take family violence intervention orders is a really important tool. Now, the breaching of those orders is where we still need to be doing more work. And this notion of evidence, evidence, evidence is really um, absolutely critical. Women need evidence for breaches. They need evidence um, at every step of the way. So the, the development of the, um, the enhancement of the police evidence gathering is where we have a really critical thing to make a difference. I say but the important part of New South Wales is that we're, we're sitting off the house or we're sitting off the victim's workplace... So we don't need the victim. Yeah, the victim is not crucial, and I think that's another part. We put a lot of pressure on victims in this space. So by targeting them, by following them in their cars, you know, watching them, checking their phones, there's a whole range of things that we do, which means that when they breach it, we don't need the victim. And Can a I breach just... might be a phone call, or it might be <coughs> going to a premises that you're not supposed to go to, and collecting evidence of that you know, should be relatively simple. It is when you present the evidence of what looks like a minor breach mm. that you have to have strong sentencing of the court because there is no minor breach of a violence restraining mm. order. There was, a classic, there was a classic one, wasn't there? <coughs> there was an absolutely now, classic domestic, one. Sorry to cut yeah, sorry. you off, Cathy. Domestic and family violence affects many Australians. If you or someone you know needs help, please contact the Domestic Violence Helpline or the Men's Referral Line. Our next question comes from David Nugent. I'm a counsellor and, and I've spent over 3,000 hours delivering men's behaviour change programs. There's many more men seeking programs like mine that there's no place for them. And my question is, what can we do to ensure men who do want to change, we give them the opportunity? OK, that's a good question. Cathy, do we have evidence that these programs work and what kind of programs are most effective? So I think that you need to think about... Does, we don't ask the question, do men's behaviour change yeah. programs work? Because it's really, who do they work for, for whom and under what conditions? Because they're all very, very different. You've got these minimalist little um, anger management programs, which are pretty useless. You saw the, the corrections program you know, which was 10 weeks, well, you can see that that 10 weeks only just scratches the surface. You know, look, it's a really good thing to do. Like, they're better to have done it than not. But actually, it's really important that, um, that we look at having men's behaviour change programs that actually get to the heart of the matter a bit more. So that in Australia, our minimum standards, where we've got minimum standards in Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland, they're half the length of programs of anywhere else in the world. They also don't necessarily address... They're not really fit for purpose insofar as a lot of the referrals come from, um, come from child protection and come from the family law arena where they're really looking for an intervention in relation to men in relation to their fathering. And those programs are not set up to really engage with men about their fathering. Now, Sarah Ferguson, you sat in on some of these programs. What was your assessment of them? I went in with a little bit of cynicism, I must say, or at least um, a heavy dose of scepticism would be a better way of putting it, um, because of the things you hear and because of the length of the programme. But to be fair, first of all, to what we were seeing there, this was a group of prisoners who were considered to be at very high risk of reoffending. So the idea that you can shift the behaviour of any member of, the, of society in 10 weeks with a significant history, it's a very tall order. So once you understand that what you're trying to do is nearly impossible, and certainly within 10 weeks, so that it, you don't have much chance of succeeding. I think my issue with it was that, in the end, it was, to all intents and purposes, about anger management. You saw Steve there. What he's talking about, taking a sip of water, is about understanding the triggers that cause him to get angry. When it came to the underlying issues, the, the issues about how they relate to women, whether they feel the need to control women, there wasn't 
anywhere near as much attention on that. So effectively, it's a men's behaviour change programme, which is about anger management, not masquerading, but <coughs> barely scratching the surface of the attitudes that, that lay beneath. So all of those men in that group will be released in the near future. I think it'll be very interesting to see what happens with each and every one of those. Mm. Nova Paris, how do you think men's behaviour can change in this aspect? Look, I'm, I'm an optimistic person. I, I think that, um, um, you know, given the right tools, people do have the ability to change. But... Um, People have to also accept responsibility for the actions, you know, that they've um, they've endured on 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 the person that um, you know they've committed the crime, but also own up to that own own up to the and be responsible for their own actions. And uh, I will say that um, you know, if men's groups, um, you know, they're sort of looked down upon. Um, I know many. Um, men, Aboriginal men in the Northern Territory are saying, we've got a problem, we, let us own the problem. You know, yes, you've got some women's shelters, but give us a men's space. Let us go and talk about our business with other men. So we know how to, they can control it, they can own it. So I know in the Northern Territory, um, the, uh, Charlie King, who's a prominent Aboriginal man with the ABC, um, his, his link up program with No More, you know, it's um, sporting, you know, through using sport as a vehicle to, to um, inspire and mentor young people in society. You know, sports is a great way to be able to drive change throughout um, Australia's community because a lot of young people look up to our sporting heroes. Um, Charlie King has got across five different sporting codes um, a domestic violence action plan, which actually men's sporting groups have signed on to. So when there is an incident within the sporting club, they know how to... Um, you know, sort of address those issues. And the big issue that they have to confront is owning up to what they've, that they've done. Marie, what's your view? Yeah, look, we need programs that hold um, men to account for their violence. Um, and I'm not sure whether the one that uh, Sarah filmed, I, I didn't see that so much in, in that short documentary. Mm -hmm. And I think um, there is a problem with programs that are 10 weeks long. You know, mm -hmm. you can't get to that depth of, um, of accountability and, and making men really see what the cause of their violence is and, and have an opportunity to actually be able to work on those sorts of things. And I think... Um, you know, we need more time to understand how men, how the best men's behaviour change programs work. We know that they work best when they're teamed up and the, the partner has support. Um, and so I think uh, there are a number of women's organisations that are now running these um, programs and I think that's probably a really good model, like looking at what works in terms of specialists in the field who are already doing this work and being able to take the best of um, practice from all of those parts. With their partners, having them... The Running them in parallel, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, because we need to ensure that women and children are safe. Um, you know, I, I think men's behaviour change programs can be um, an incredible way of, um, you know, talking about the violence and talking about the impacts of violence on on partner and family. But if men are not held to account and the women are not supported and are mm -hmm. and understand what this program looks like and the sorts of things that are going on in the program, that can be really dangerous. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're watching Q&A Hitting Home. Our next question comes from Josie Gregory. Many female victims of domestic violence are forced to leave their homes and possessions when fleeing the perpetrator. This often results in homelessness and severe financial suffering for the woman. Why isn't more emphasis placed on getting the kids and mum to stay in the home? And if a divorce ensues, why isn't it more why isn't more emphasis placed on the presence of domestic violence as a major contributor when a property settlement is decided and arrangements for children? Christian Porter, putting the children back into the picture. Do we need to flip yeah. through our, our thinking about men leaving or women leaving? Uh, I mean, the point that you raise is totally correct, that what happens in the flashpoint incidents of domestic violence, that it is almost invariably the woman who has done nothing wrong, who is the victim of the offending, who leaves the home. I mean, there have been some good innovations at a state level in policing, things like cool-down orders, where um, the perpetrator or suspected perpetrator, without even enough um, evidence to arrest, is given a cool-down order and they must leave for 72 hours. And so sometimes very practical things like that can be of huge, huge effect. But I think that the focus on the housing needs of the victim have to be paramount. The Commonwealth Government recently renewed a national partnership against homelessness and that was about 230 million with the specific requirement when the money goes to the states that the focus be on um, the homelessness caused for 
uh, domestic violence victims. And I think that we're always discussing how do you have the greatest effect on what is always the spending of scarce resources. So having a focus like that on, on funding like that, homelessness funding, I think is very important. But you raise a, a deep issue. The family law issues you raise are intensely complicated and I'm not an expert on family law, I must say, but um, you know, what you seem to be saying is that there could be greater account taken in of, of the fact of domestic violence. And I think that as a matter of course, those types of things are taken into account to an extent in family law proceedings, but of course family law proceedings are intensely complicated, perhaps too complicated. Mick, do you think we could contemplate a, an environment where the perpetrators are forced to leave? Look, absolutely. New South Wales is running a program called Stay Home, um, Leave Violence. And, but not every victim wants to stay home. You know, there, yeah. there, there's certainly challenges around that you'll never quite feel safe at home because he knows where you are. And so I think there are many faces to domestic violence, but I do think there is a huge issue when women have to leave. They you know, nearly always have the children, and, and the children are the, the really silent victims in this. Um, and it becomes challenging for law enforcement, of course, during these times, whilst you're trying to deal with the offender, and then you still have the victim and the family at that stage, and they don't want to stay at home. And we accept that just changing the locks is not always going to protect you from violence. So what's going to be best for the children in that circumstance, Cathy? So I think that... If you can keep women and children, and particularly children in their own homes, there's a whole lot of things that are well secure for them. You know, they don't have to change schools, they don't have to change their doctors, they don't have to change their friendship networks, um, they don't have to, to change um, where, where they're safe in their neighbourhoods. But the thing is, and when we've done the research in the area around safe at home strategies in Victoria, it's very clear that it only suits a small, you know, it, it suits a group of women and their children. But you can see, you know, what about the woman in that program? Mm. You know, she was in a fortress and terrified. And actually, that's not a particularly good use of safe at home. So that we also saw when we were looking at women in intervention orders when they were safe at home, those breaches on intervention orders were off the wall. So that not necessarily reported, but when you asked women about the breaching of those orders, it was, it was enormous in stuff that I'd never seen in, in any of the other international literature. So that... There's a group of women that really want to stay in their own homes and we should make that possible. But that it's actually it's about choice and having a choice of affordable housing, some of which would be in, their, in the home that they used to share. But, you know, some of those women have been brought there um, as a strategy of isolation to get them away from their friends and family. Some, you know, some, one woman said to me, well, you know, he's bashed my head against every wall in that house. I actually don't want to stay here anymore. So I think that... It's about, you know, being able to listen to women and to be able to be responsive to their children and the needs of the women in that situation. And you increasingly, I think, need innovative solutions. I met um, someone recently who was developing a micro-charity to get the community engaged in finding that temporary housing, which would use the same sort of apps that Airbnb use, mm -hmm. so that the community can offer their homes for a period to people in their great period of need. And what an amazing initiative. So I think that, you know, this isn't a problem just of government or just of the police. This is a problem that we all share in civil society. So trying to find innovative solutions to things like those immediate needs of housing at, at, at these terrible flashpoints um, is something that we've got to keep really open minds to. Except that there will always be um, a need for crisis services Un and for specialist services um, and you can't replace that stuff with um, It'll always you know, be a, a room in someone's house. All right, you're watching Q&A Hitting Home. I'm Julia Baird. <laughs> And our next question is from Leslie Spruce. Uh, the most in influential learning environment for children is the home, and yet when women report verbal and emotional abuse to police, it's rarely taken seriously and they're not given any protection. Women say that they would rather be hit as bruises and cuts heal far more quickly and their children are learning and copying dad's denigration and disrespect. What changes can be made to the police and the judicial systems to ensure that their response is in line with the message that any abuse of women, not just the physical abuse, is wrong and will not be ignored? Mick Fuller. Yeah, and it's a good point. And as we saw tonight, is often that controlling, coercive type profile offender is the most dangerous 
out of the lot and, and you're more likely to die at the hands of someone like that. And look, from a police perspective, um, you know, you go back 10 years, there was probably one course around domestic violence. Now in the space of New South Wales and most other states would be the same. We do more training around domestic violence than we do any other single crime type. I mean, we recognise that this scope of domestic violence is that we're far from having won the war. You know, we've changed generationally and, and we've come such a long way and, and I think everyone would say that we know we've got a long way to go. Um, but at the end of the day is that we're open to learning, we're, we're open to hearing stories, you know, from victims. Um, you know, we, we feel the pain. We've been at the cold face for this too for, for a long, long time. And I know sometimes we get it wrong. But from an organisation's perspective, you know, we'll put our hands up and say, we've got it wrong, how can we fix this? And I think, you know, law enforcement, modern law enforcement in Australia, they're learning organisations and that's not lost on us. Yeah, that is the question though, because how <coughs> can the police deal with the evidence questions when it's not physical abuse? Mm. That, and that's where it comes into, the police aren't the answer to all of these problems. And, you know, the, the, the fast pathing of victims into other services that can help is really the key in this. And if you're not a criminal you know, victim, but you're still a victim of domestic violence, it's about how best do police connect you with other services that can help you make the right decision. And I think that's important for police. And we've had some big changes in New South Wales around automated systems that allow us to put um, women into a computer system that will risk rate them and fast track them into services. Now you don't have to be a victim of physical um, domestic violence to be put into that situation. So I think again, you know, we're learning from our mistakes and we're trying not to just be the, you know, the law enforcement model that just looks at crime, but we we'll also see that there's a big space in how we connect victims into other services. Lou, you've been on the front line for many years. How can we deal better with verbal psychological abuse? Look, I think um, it's interesting hearing Mick um, talk about the improvements in the police because um, certainly what we see a lot of is the system failing um, and sometimes that's the police but sometimes the police do the most wonderful job you could possibly imagine and then it gets to court and everything falls apart. I think um, we really need to think, we, we, you know, we need the magistrates, we need the judicial system to really be enforcing um, AVOs, but also I think be thinking um, in depth about the impacts and understanding the impacts of DV and drama and understanding what it is for a woman to go through that process. I mean, I think we saw in part one yesterday um, a, a beautiful um, explanation of the journey of a woman through the judicial system. It's not always like that. Um, it can be a lot tougher than that and there are, um, there are often systemic failings. Um, and when you're in, an, in a relationship and you're being abused and you feel as if you're not being believed by the system or supported by the system, that can be an incredibly difficult place. So is that the be. question, is that the cultural change you're talking about? A question of credibility, of taking it seriously and fathoming what it's like to be in the shoes of someone who's being abused in such a way? Look, I think, um, I think we are shifting, but we also live in a culture which, where victim blaming is fairly normal. It's a fairly normal part of culture. And I, I think the minister will agree this morning, there was a really, um, a very important report um, looking at the culture of victim blaming within our society, particularly with young people. Um, that's the sort of stuff that we have to shift in tandem with the victim blaming of police systems, judicial systems, um, to be able to make this change in the longer term. I mean, the Prime Minister launched um, research that we had commissioned in the Commonwealth Government about this very issue. And it, it looked at qualitative focus groups and particularly young boys and how they responded to certain scenarios that were put to them that involved violence um, by a young boy against a young girl, amongst other things. Um, and this is meant to and will inform a $30 million federal campaign to raise awareness and try and change the sort of attitudes that we've heard a little bit about tonight. But what the report um, showed, and it is absolutely fascinating reading, reducing violence against women and their children, is that there is this um, ongoing minimisation, this permissiveness against violence, this lack of understanding as to what constitutes intimidatory or violating behaviour. And um, we spoke earlier about men's programs. I mean, the key here is young, young men, boys. Um, and they can be influenced by certain people, and we know this from the research that we commissioned today, probably not unsurprisingly, sports stars and those sort of people, but they're very influenced by their mothers. Um, and, and their fathers. So if we can change the attitudes and make sure that young boys understand what a respectful relationship is, understand what are the proper boundaries, understand what's acceptable and not acceptable, 
they will go on to be good fathers and good husbands and good partners and we won't have to have as many men's programs as we presently need. Now just going back to the question of psychological abuse, is this also a big problem in Indigenous communities, Nova? Massively. Um, people think that domestic violence is presenting with scars on your face or blood pouring out of your you know, out of the scars. Um, domestic violence is, is so many forms and, and I think, um, you know, whilst Christian's talking about the public awareness, you know, um, which is fantastic because we need to educate society on what constitutes domestic violence. So if this public awareness draws you to 1800 Respect hotline, we need to ensure that when that person rings 1800 Respect, they're going to get all the services that 1800 Respect promises, you know, and, and I think that we're, we're, we're on a big winner in, in that sort of area. I think, um, um, you know, the whole denigration of women, that whole respect factor, you know, um, you know I, I, I know many people that um, have been called several names, you know, um, in terms of that, it's not just a name calling, it's being told that you're worthless every single day of your life and that leads you down to a path where you think, well, where's the hope? I'll just put up with another, um, you know, punch in the face because tomorrow or the next couple of days is a honeymoon period. They'll say sorry because they think they physically scarred you from that. So we need that education and I think, um, I know Daniel Andrews, Premier of Victoria, is, is taking the lead in terms of looking at, you know, schools, education to implement programs on behaviour, how young girls can treat young men, how young boys can treat young girls. That whole relationship, you know, what a great society we could be if our young kids knew how to treat each other as, as respectful human beings. Thank you. All right, let's go to a video question next from Tim Austin in Brisbane. Growing up, I witnessed and was subjected to domestic violence. Through my teenage and early adult years, I was sad, angry, turned to alcohol to numb the pain and even attempted suicide. I had no idea why I felt like this until later in my adult life when I was diagnosed with anxiety, depression and PTSD, which were a direct result of the domestic violence I was exposed to growing up. All women and children should be able to live in a home environment free of violence and abuse. My question to the panel is, what is being done for all the children impacted like me? What is being done for those children suffering today, tonight and tomorrow? Sarah Ferguson. <laughs> now what, what reflections do you have on this? I mean, some of the most poignant moments in the documentary were you sitting and talking to children in those refuges. What did you think could be done and are we doing enough? Well, that, that's such a huge question, isn't it? Because the, all of the children that we saw in the refuge, they do what children do so beautifully, which is to live in the present. But all of them had the shadow of the violence that they'd grown up with. And all of them had, in fact, a very practical idea. You know, they, one, one, I sat doing that uh, loom band thing with uh, the young girl and she just said, it's really simple. You just say no the first time. You never give them a second chance. And they, they understand it, but there's the... the the need amongst the children and so many of the parents that we met said erroneously that they thought their children were protected because they were in their bedrooms and they hadn't actually seen it. So it's another problem without not holding the women to account for that or the, or the, the perpetrators for sure, not the women, but they were telling themselves over many years that it was okay when it clearly wasn't okay. So that comes back to the education that if you have any sense of the impact on children, but because we're, it's so difficult to report on the impact on children, we don't hear about it until you're that person years later having to be treated, treated for it. So we have to find a way also to get the children to tell us how they're feeling. And of course, that's, that comes down to funding, that comes down to intervention. I know this, this comes down to your research as well. Catherine, what, can, what light can you shed on it? I guess um, I think the children's issues are some of the most marginalised because, because it, it's not as though they're a minority group. They're actually, you know, the majority yeah. of people in the refuge are children. But we don't have children's workers in every refuge. Yeah. We actually also, most of the programs that are about the healing programs, the, the um, intervention after violence, most of those are pilots. You know, we've got too many pilots, not enough aeroplanes. You know, that they're <laughs> in the two-year period when I was looking at an audit in Victoria um, of these programs for children, you know, lots of wonderful creative group work, lots of wonderful interventions children, two years later, they're all gone. Mm. 
Mm. Okay, so that they're very ephemeral and you have to always be showing that you're doing something new so that I think there's a real problem about the way we fund these, the programs for children and I think that we're just not doing enough in that area. If we're talking about children, I also think we need to talk about pregnant women. Mm -hmm. That in fact, that's double intention violence. So that you, when you've got violence against women who are pregnant, we need to be taking this extremely seriously because actually that's violence against the child and it's violence against the woman. And it's also very clear that that group of offenders who are perpetrators of violence who are beating women up when they're pregnant are very dangerous. They're mm. responding to, um, to vulnerability with violence rather than protection. And not all, um, and certainly all women who are pregnant and in abusive relationships, actually in the personal safety survey, it, four out of five women were not being beaten during present pregnancy. You know, actually it is really violent offenders who are beating up women in pregnancy. We need to take it really seriously. Mm. Okay, our next question is from Kate Hewson. The campaign to end violence against women deserves every bit of the attention it's receiving and more. But there are also cases uh, where men are the targets of domestic abuse. One organisation reports it as one in three incidents of domestic violence. Um, I wanted to ask the panel whether they agree with that statistic and if so, um, why male subjects of domestic violence are so heavily excluded from the current discussions. OK, Christian Porter. I, I don't accept that statistic. I, I don't know where it's come from. I'll be having a good look at it. Um, it, this is very sadly, and it's something we just have to be blunt and honest and open about or we'll never break the cycle, this is a problem that is perpetrated by men against women and girls. Almost overwhelmingly, almost exclusively. Yeah, can I say that in terms of in New South Wales, and statistics are interesting, but around 25% of men present as victims of DV assaults out of that cohort. But interesting, of that 25%, more than half of the offender is still male. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's an important part of this process as well, is, you know, you know any victim of crime deserves a service, uh, and that's no doubt. But we can't lose sight of the fact that more than half of the cohort of, of the male victims, the offenders, are male themselves. Yeah, no and I think perpetrators get really smart at, um, you know, pretending to be a victim. They're very good at playing systems as well. Um, I'm, I think we need to do more research and get um, some really solid figures and a, and a better understanding of um, male victims because, of course, there must be male victims in, in that heterosexual um, relationship context, but it, it's very, very small. And speaking of research, Cathy. OK, so that my understanding of the data is that... Um, and, there's the, um, and that the more, most recent analysis of the, our big prevalence data mm. for Australia, the Personal Safety Survey, does say, look, one in three women over, over 15 have been victims of either physical or sexual abuse yeah. from um, an, a known man, OK? But that isn't the same as one in three men saying that they are victims. In fact, that's a, that's a distortion of the data. And right. the Personal Safety Survey has been very good about clarifying where that data is coming yeah. from. There are about 200... Sorry, about roughly two million victims of domestic violence reported in the personal safety survey, of which about 450,000 are men. That means there's 30% of the victims of cohabiting partners who are men and 70% that are women. So that, in fact, you do have a group of men who are reporting victimisation. But you get better data actually out of the British Crime Survey, which has um, you know, a survey of 23,000, because they count not victims, they count incidents. So you get a better idea of severity out of the British Crime Survey. So you actually see high rates of reported one-off incidents, like men, so there's a lot of abuse of men, you know, where they're reporting about 9% of men and about 14% of women in the, in the last year. But you know, so that's not too much difference, but actually when you look at who's reporting um, four or more incidents, 89% were women. OK. When you're looking at, can I just say one more figure, that when you're looking at the number of incidents as a whole, 81% were um, violence by men against women. 
So that, you know, the, when you look at severity, um, you get a different picture emerging and it's very clearly a dominant pattern of violence against women by known men. OK, you're watching Q&A hitting home. <clears throat> We've got a lot to cover tonight. Our next question comes from Alex Davis. Uh, recent research highlights that three out of five Australians have experienced technology-facilitated harassment. When this sort of abuse intersects with domestic violence, it gives perpetrators new tools for old behaviours and it has unique impacts on victims of violence. They often feel tethered to their abusers, they are tracked, put under surveillance, have intimate images actually or threatened to be shared online without consent. How can our legal system catch up to deal with technology facilitated domestic violence? And how can we shift attitudes that this form of abuse, so this form of abuse is not trivialised and so that perpetrators are held to account? Mick Fuller. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, and it's a good question. And look, technology is always a challenge in the space of law enforcement because it changes in all types of crimes, and you know we continually evolve to try and meet those needs. And you know, I, I think whilst technology changes, the, the wonderful part about it is that there's an, a, a really good opportunity for victims to collect wonderful evidence from technology as well, because we know contact is made through Facebook and a whole range of other forums. And, and, and if the victims can save that sort of information, it gives us the ability to, to make the charge, to support the victim. So I think we shouldn't be scared of technology, but I think victims need to save every trace, every contact, because it's like a fingerprint, you know, and, and we can get access to that information. So I don't think we should be scared of technology, but I think victims need to be reminded that they need to save every fingerprint that is left to allow us to help them as far, much as we can. Yeah, I think Alex has a follow-up question. Um, I should have mentioned that I'm a solicitor at a community legal centre, and so I work with a lot of victims of domestic violence and a lot of victims who are experiencing technology-facilitated domestic violence. And while I agree that there should be more evidence um, that can be used in these situations, we're seeing for a lot of our clients that police won't take action because it's a little bit too difficult to get some of the evidence that's necessary to lay charges. If it's a situation that we can lawfully obtain the information, then that's what we should do. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, but it just depends on what the offence is as to whether or not we can access that type of data lawfully through search warrant or otherwise. So, again, it does present challenges to it because it's more complex than just a simple assault. But nevertheless, if the offence uh, is there, then we have the ability through the judicial process to get search warrants and other messages. To, to obtain most of that type of data. Now, what do you think about this, Christian Porter? I mean, it's important this is not dismissed as, as, as trolling. No, no. Again, this is part of that problem about having a proper understanding about what is unacceptable conduct and what constitutes a violation of, of women's rights. Um, and what you've spoken about is the use of modern technology phones to, to harass, to intimidate, to stalk. I mean, I've seen these prosecutions run. The phone is a mechanism for stalking now. The $100 million that I spoke about earlier, a lot of that is designed to try and find and enliven really practical solutions. And some of that money is designed to go to ensuring that during crisis points for victims of domestic violence, they get new phones ones that the husband does not know or the partner does not know the number of. Now, so you know, technology is both, both virtue and, and vice, but you have to constantly look for creative, innovative, practical ways to try and break that nexus in, in the poor use of technology and then enhance the nexus for the great use of technology. I mean, when I was a prosecutor, we weren't video recording the, uh, the evidence. What a fantastic tool. I mean, it's remarkably helpful, but also can be a big problem. But I also think that we're not using enough of the stalking legislation. Mm. That, in fact, you know, putting together a case that's not based on an incident but based on a course mm. of conduct... It's difficult. It's difficult. The courts don't like it very much. Mm. They much prefer a clear-cut incident. And we have to be pulling together the evidence and getting police and the courts to really take um, the stalking legislation really, really um, mm. seriously because that is the way in. OK, I want to go to a question now because we're quickly running out of time from Geoffrey Judd. In the introductory notes for this program, Nova Spiritus was the only person to mention the involvement and impact of alcohol on domestic violence. The National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children 2010-2020 
is a great initiative, but only little reference is made to alcohol. What is the reason when my local area police say 95% of the domestic violence they see is alcohol related? Nova Paris. Um, alcohol is a big factor. You know, we, we can't live in denial to say that it doesn't. It doesn't excuse domestic violence. It doesn't excuse violence, but it is a big factor. Um, I know that recent statistics over the last three or four months in the Northern Territory, 67% of domestic violence assaults was alcohol related. So we've got a big problem. But in terms of um, people um, having alcohol problems, it goes back to the rehabilitation side of things. You know, we shouldn't be shutting down alcohol and other drugs, um, uh, rehabilitation centres, we should be opening them. You know, it's not just a, an Indigenous problem, it's, it's a society problem. And it's almost like when you hear statistics that come out and say, oh, well, that, that domestic violence was alcohol related, it justifies that, uh, that abuse to some extent. So, you know, we as a society should not put up with it. It is a contributing factor. I mean, I, I advocated, um, you know, for the 1am lockout uh, rule in the, in the Northern Territory. And, you know, when, when you're a politician trying to shut down, you know, the lockout rules, you, you know, you've got the, the, the big hotel lobbyist groups um, that are going to come Keep down and, <laughs> and, and smack Absolutely. you. So um, it has a problem. And, and when we come um, to grips with it, to allow people who say, yes, we've got an alcohol problem, allow them to go to rehab. Um, in the Northern Territory, um, we have mandatory health, alcohol rehab centres where, you know, we're, we're saying that a health problem is a criminal problem and we are locking up people who have a health problem. So what that does, it, it does, it takes away the beds from the people who say, I want to go to rehab, but I've got a family. So we need to actually look at the whole alcohol problem that can be a family issue as well. Women want to go to rehab. They can't take their children. And when they do leave their children, you know, you've got child protection that will come away and say that mother's got a problem. Well, her child's shouldn't be with her. So there's a whole, this whole, everything that we're talking about is very, very complex. Mm -hmm. However, we need to support the frontline services that are going to help break this cycle. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid we've got time for just one last question. It comes from Max Fisher. Um, so in uh, Sarah Ferguson's documentary, Hitting Home, we heard that domestic violences are rife in all demographics and suburbs in Australia. And uh, Christian Porter has also said that it's a dangerous attitude that ingrained in our society that leave women thinking that they're to blame. So I ask that what can we as a young and future generation do to ensure that these attitudes do not become ingra ingrained in our lives? Thank you, Max. Mo. Look, I think, I, I like you, Nova, I'm an optimist. I think we can shift this with a gener within a generation. I think um, with well-funded school programs that are really looking at those whole of school approaches and thinking about how that fits in with the community and, um, and you know, all of the parts together, I think a well-funded service system, um, I think, you know, in the long term, we can actually shift this. Um, we're, we're moving towards it now. We've already seen some shifts in attitudes. We know what works. We know what the service system needs to look, look like. We know what government needs to fund. Um, we know what we need as a society to be able to get to the next bit. Um, I think we just, we need some money put in. <laughs> Yeah, Julia, it wasn't that long ago that parents driving home intoxicated without their seatbelts on while smoking in the Correct. car mm. yeah. was socially acceptable. Yeah. Where now, if you Correct. went to a barbecue and someone tried any of those three things, yeah. everybody would stop them, take the keys off them. What are you doing? Yeah. And they're not even as close as a huge social issue as domestic violence is. Mm -hmm. so, so if we can fix seatbelts, smoking and drink driving, surely we can fix this problem. Mm. Yeah. Kathy, what about... What about those people that, that worry that momentum might be lost if Rosie Batty is no longer Australian of the Year? I, mean... I think that Rosie Batty's been incredibly important um, and will be speaking to the Victorian Parliament tomorrow, um, brave woman that she is. But she's helped with the momentum, but I think that now it's on the agenda. We've just got to work every one of us to keep it on the agenda because we can see that once it's on the agenda, then... Um, it means that it, there's two things that it does. It keeps it as a public issue and where we can have a public and um, a very good health response to it. 
um, which is what we what we need. We need to sort of recognise it as one of these public health is issues where we can change attitudes and make a difference. Um, but I also think that as soon as you close down the debate and the discussion about mm. domestic violence, it also means that victims go silent. Mm. So if we want to be able to have victims having a voice, then we've also got to keep it on the public agenda. Christian Porter, Sarah posed the question, can we stop this epidemic in one generation? Uh, we've already come a long way. I mean, when you look back at where we were in the 1970s and 80s where this problem was just put under a carpet, um, we've come a long way. We can go much further. You know, Max, for a young man, um, I think the way that we change attitudes is for you and your friends to, to listen to the women in your life, to your mother, your girlfriend, whoever it might be, but they will offer you insights and experience that is not your own and will make you intelligent and understanding of experiences that, that you won't have in life. And I think that if, if you and your generation of young men can do that, we won't face this problem in 20 or 30 years. OK, that is all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Moo Bolsh, Christian Porter, Nova Paris, Mick Fuller and Cathy Humphrey. <laughs> Thanks for joining this special edition of Q&A tonight. Now, we hope we've added to the momentum to overcome this crisis. If you tune in tomorrow night for Call Me Dad, which takes a closer look at how to change men's behaviour. And remember, if you need urgent help, contact the helpline numbers we've been showing on screen. Now, it's been a night of difficult viewing, so we'll end tonight with a beautiful song written by Kate Miller-Heidke, Tina Arena and John Hume. It's called When You're Ready, and it's performed by Tina Arena and John Hume. I'm Julia Baird. Tony Jones will be back with you in 2016. Good night. Some folks are not like us They fear themselves They murder trust And there's a shadow deep inside There's a hole that'll eat you alive Hey Nobody can steal your spark And when you're ready to leave When you're ready to leave I'll be there I know who you really are I know you got a lion's heart And when you're ready to leave When you're ready to leave I'll be there And when you're ready to grieve You better believe I'll be there some things we don't discuss They hurt too much They gather dust Just know this broom and brush Won't sweep away the truth of us hey. Steal your spark when you're ready to leave. When you're ready to leave, I'll be there. I know who you really are. I know you got a lion's heart, and you shoot on through. Light up the door, cause the biggest flame starts with a tiny.
If you require information or support on issues raised in this program, please contact one of these services.